Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome, everyone. This is Ryan Tripp, your host for New Books in History, New Books Network. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Martin Jay. He's the Sidney Ehrman Professor of History Emeritus at the UC at UC Berkeley. He recently published Eminent Critiques: The Frankfurt School Under Pressure, which we're going to be discussing today. Welcome, Professor Jay. Great to be here, Ryan. Happy to do this again. All right. Um, yes, this is our third time talking. Uh, so let's just dive into the questions. Uh, again, your book is uh, Eminent Critiques, published earlier this year by Bristol Press. Uh, so to start, can you first explain the, uh, ne- quote, negative dialectic of trans- transcendent and imminent critique? And if you want to focus on imminent critique, you can. It's the title of your book. And, yeah. and uh, the two's uh, reconcilability or um, irreconcilability, that is the uh, transcendent and eminent critique, in the context of Walter Benjamin and the history of Frankfurt School ideas. Okay, the idea of eminent critique um, is uh, taken, of course, from uh, the practice of the Frankfurt School, uh, which for a very long period of time uh, felt compelled to give a justification for its uh, critical vantage point. Now, there is actually in the history of the reception of critical theory a debate over whether or not such a justification is necessary. And some people or you know you simply need uh, a kind of intuitive sense of injustice or of oppression, and you don't have to give uh, a what we might call plausible explanation of where you're coming from. But there are others in the critical theory tradition who have said, no, it's necessary to do so. And the reason they give is that uh, basically critique has to be directed not merely towards an object, towards the world outside, which needs to be uh, in some ways uh, criticized and improved, but also needs to be directed uh, inwardly. That is to say, one has to ask, uh, who is doing the criticism? What is the ground of the criticism? What is the justification of the criticism? As a result, uh, critical theory, uh, the, the tradition of the Frankfurt School developed by Max Horkheimer and his colleagues, uh, often sought to find some sort of what the French would call point d'appui, a kind of point from which critique can be launched. And broadly speaking, there were two alternatives. The first we might call transcendent, that is to say the belief that there are uh, eternal, abiding, uh, and universal uh, norms uh, that need to be brought into play whenever one does uh, a critique of actually existing uh, circumstances. So, for example, uh, equality or freedom uh, or justice or the end of exploitation. We can give a lot uh, lot of examples of what might be seen as ahistorical, eternal, transcendent ideals, which then can be uh, brought to bear. Now, the argument against this was, of course, that these allegedly universal eternal ideals were themselves uh, grounded in particular historical circumstances, that uh, seemingly transcendent critique was really the expression of the viewpoint, the interests even, of what we might call local and parochial uh, groups. And therefore, it was necessary uh, to put them under pressure, to do a kind of, we might call it, metacritique of transcendent norms. And the uh, alternative to this was the idea of an imminent critique, one that was not based on allegedly historical and eternal and universal norms, but one that took instead the standards of a particular community, the standards of a particular form of life, the standards of a particular moment, and said that there was a gap between those standards, those uh, what we might call uh, professed values, and practice. So that, for example, in the uh, case of countries that call themselves democratic, uh, and give you a kind of a series of uh, explanations of what democracy really means, uh, if their practice is not democratic, if in fact certain groups are excluded or certain voices uh, are not allowed to be heard, then there is an imminent critique based on the value of the uh, the ideology or the theory or the uh, philosophical understanding of the society. In addition, imminent critique was based on the idea that there can be what uh, is sometimes called a performative contradiction, uh, in which, for example, uh, there is a critique of the idea of uh, rational discourse, a critique of the idea of giving reasons, uh, because it seems to be something that is uh, 
done only by certain people who have the capacity to reason, the capacity to make uh, educated arguments. Uh, and uh, this capacity is then called into question. But if it is done so by giving reasons, if it is done so by giving justifications for undermining it, then there is a performative contradiction because what is being attacked is in fact being uh, practically performed. And so imminent critique also brings that uh, kind of uh, contradiction uh, into play. Now, the story is a very complicated one because imminent critique itself uh, comes under question, uh, becomes problematic when the gap between uh, the professed values of a society and what the society actually is doing narrows. And in the history of the Frankfurt School, there was um, a, an alarm that was uh, sounded, a toxin that was sounded, we might say, when uh, Adorno and Horkheimer talked about uh, an entirely administered society, and when Herbert Marcuse talked about a one-dimensional society. Because what they uh, suggested by that was that uh, the society's values were themselves uh, somehow so corrupted uh, that there was no gap between uh, what was called for and what was actually done. So if the society, for example, uh, valued uh, uh, what we might call a neoliberal economic uh, uh, self-sufficiency and uh, it was opposed to the uh, ideals of uh, solidarity or uh, even socialist uh, uh, communitarianism, uh, those ideals were in fact realized by a society which was based on selfish, self uh, protection, uh, self interest, uh, and uh, uh, self, uh, uh, we might call it uh, uh, even selfishness. So the gap between values and uh, practices uh, was shortened, was narrowed, uh, and lost itself, uh, lost the ability to be a source of an inner critique, which brought back the necessity, we might say, of something. Uh, that was transcendent, transcending this particular society. The other issue, of course, that the transcendent critique <clears throat> raises is the fact that every society has competing values. Every society has values which are introduced from, as it were, the outside. So if in a particularly, uh, let's say, closed communitarian, even totalitarian society, there are some people who appeal to human rights as transcending that society, as uh, universal and uh, basically uh, somehow supported by values that are not imminent in the society at the moment, it's possible for them to use those as a critical vantage point. So the upshot of all this, we might say, is that there is a negative dialectic of transcendent and imminent critique, one that uh, understands the inadequacy of each and also the difficulty, if not a possibility, of combining them in a seamless way. So critical theory, we might say, uh, is dependent on uh, historically variable sources of critical uh, energy. Uh, and I think that's one of the valuable uh, lessons of the uh, history of the theory, that at times uh, it was close to the imminent, at times it was close to the transcendent critique. Now, having said that, and I'm sure I haven't explained it with full clarity, it's one of those issues that needs to be really unpacked very carefully. The book itself is called Imminent Critiques because it uh, includes um, a number of essays written over the past few years. One of them is a bit older, written in uh, the 20 hundreds. Uh, essays that are based to a certain extent on pitting the values of critical theory, or at least uh, some of its, uh, let's say, critical uh, impulses, against its own practice, against its own, uh, perhaps, uh, inconsistent practices. I'm not going to call it hypocritical, but at least there's a tension that existed. And so the book tries to tease out some of the, let's say, uh, hidden or at least uh, hitherto not fully appreciated uh, tensions, I wouldn't call them fully contradictions, within critical theory itself. And so I call the the book, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, under uh, title, uh, is, is Frankfurt School Under Pressure. So what I'm trying to do is put a little pressure on the tradition rather than simply be its spokesman. And so each of the essays, to one degree or another, presents a kind of imminent critique of some of the Frank School's own arguments, uh, some uh, very explicitly, others more indirectly. But that's, I would say, what ties the book together, using imminent critique in an imminently critical way. Okay. Uh, well, I sufficiently unpacked it for me, but um, I'm sure our audiences will love to read the book to further, further... Uh, uh, understand that concept. So, um, or rather that negative dialectic. 
So next, how does the idea of an expanded field, you, you, you discuss this in the book and it's kind of interesting in this, how does the idea of an expanded field in historical narratives, and you use the example, um, or you actually rather focus on the so-called German 1968 and then expand that to 1967 and 1945. So how does this idea of expanded field in historical narratives and methodology engage with concerns over uh, Frankfurt School, uh, possible Eurocentrism, without infusing uh, their shifting ideas with the kind of amorphous post-structuralist thought? Uh, the idea of expanded field uh, is one that I uh, take to a certain extent from uh, the work of Walter Benjamin, who argued for dialectical images which broke through a single historicist narrative with a, uh, let's call it, uh, major protagonist whose adventures are followed over time, and instead argues that uh, there has to be a kind of active uh, destruction of that narrative uh, and a reassembling of the fragments uh, in new constellations, uh, which include our own interests today. So 1968, the German 1968, the essay that opens the book, uh, is pitted against uh, the war in the Middle East in 1967, and also the memory of 1945 and the part of German Jewish uh, survivors. The Frankfurt School mostly uh, were German Jewish survivors. And also against uh, the year when the essay was first composed, which I think it was 2019. So all of these are put into play as different moments in an expanded field. Now, later, it's interesting that you would notice the implications of this for Eurocentrism. Later, in an essay which uh, has not yet been published, which I gave at the conference uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, at Harvard a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, on uh, the centenary of the Frankfurt School uh, or the Institute of Social Research, I argue that the idea of an expanded field can also help us understand the uh, Eurocentric limits, but also the ways in which Eurocentrism is undermined in the history of the school. First of all, it's often charged that the Frankfurt School was indifferent uh, in its long history to the so-called Third World, what we now call the Global South, that it focused mostly uh, on uh, the Northern Hemisphere on Europe and, of course, the United States. Now, my argument there is that, well, first of all, by uh, being uh, forced out of Germany in 1933, and many of them, of course, went almost immediately to the United States, lived there for a dozen years, and a good number of them, of course, stayed after uh, the uh, Second World War ended. Uh, the Frankfurt School's critical theater was already decentered, deterritorialized. It was already engaged in a kind of, uh, I would call it, Euro or Westocentric self-critique, because it understood that there was something different that was happening in the United States, and one had to take that into account. Uh, Detlef Klaus famously said that without uh, the American experience, there would have been no critical theory. But it is certainly true, and Enzo Traverso and others made this point, that uh, there was very little interest in uh, uh, the so-called uh, third world. And I remember having a conversation with Herbert Marcuse, where I asked him if he was interested in going to Castro's Cuba. And he said, well, you know, I don't speak Spanish, and uh, I, I think I probably will uh, avoid the opportunity of going there. And he never, as far as I know, actually did go. Now, what one could argue today, uh, and of course this begins really, let's say, perhaps 30, 40 years ago, the internationalization, the globalization of critical theory has meant that there is now an extraordinary interest outside of uh, the Northern Hemisphere, outside of the United States and of Europe, all throughout the world. And I was struck when I went to a conference in Frankfurt uh, in uh, September, uh, uh, which dealt with the centenary of the Institute, how many of the speakers came from other parts of the world. And uh, there is a consortium of critical theory um, uh, organizations, uh, there are programs, there are uh, conferences, there are journals, uh, a consortium which Judith Butler uh, basically began to organize at Berkeley many years ago, which includes something like 500 different uh, critical theory groups around the world. And this shows the extent to which critical theory has no longer uh, you know, been uh, confined to Europe and America. Now, the point I make in that paper that I gave at Harvard is very simple, that this is not yet a theory which has been, uh, uh, let's call it symmetrically uh, influenced by what is coming from the outside. Uh, instead, it is basically a question of the uh, reception uh, and uh, the discussion of critical theory uh, 
uh, initiated in Europe, initiated in the United States, uh, elsewhere. So there are, you know, lots of articles about uh, what Adorno or Benjamin taught in, say, uh, the reception of Brazil or in uh, China or elsewhere. What needs to be done now, and what is the importance of the 21st century uh, expansion, the second century of the history, is the the symmetricalization, we might say, of the uh, influence. That is to say, we in the first world, if we still want to use that locution, uh, are very hopeful that we'll be instructed by, uh, by the critical theorists who have emerged elsewhere, and that the expansion of critical theory is one which will decenter it from its uh, origins. And this is ultimately a, a healthy thing. I mean, traveling theory, as Edward Said famously pointed out, involves a kind of uh, creative misreading, a stretching, a, a translation process which loses something uh, in terms of uh, precise uh, application of the original ideas, but gains something by the creative misreading that produces new and unexpected insights that uh, recontextualizes and gives us uh, a sense of uh, the opportunities that were not fully uh, appreciated uh, the first time through. I mean, one could argue the importance of history in critical theory. The critical theory was never uh, interested in the, uh, we might call the canonical sacralization of their original texts or ideas, but rather understood them as produced by, or at least uh, inflected through, we might say, their historical uh, context. And as that context changed, changed when they came to the United States, as it changed when they returned to post-Nazi Germany, it now is changing. Its critical theory is expanding into a global discussion. Now, there is, of course, and people have argued this, the issue of dilution, where critical theory becomes a kind of empty slogan, meaning absolutely nothing. And the issue of post-structuralism, which you raised, is a complicated one, because my general feeling is that the opposition between critical theory and French thought, which was so prevalent in the 1980s, uh, 1990s, uh, is now no longer, I think, uh, a valid way to look at things because we've learned from post-structuralist thought. There's been, I think, a productive dialogue uh, which includes, uh, you know, the uh, air, the heirs, we might say, of Foucault and uh, Lacan and uh, Derrida and uh, Deleuze uh, and Lyotard uh, with uh, Habermas uh, and uh, Axel Hohn and other uh, more recent critical theorists, so that it's not an either or. And the expanded field includes insights from all these traditions, which of course have had their impact uh, outside uh, Europe as well. So I'm, I would say, cautiously optimistic about the implications of expanding the field and allowing us to think through the history of critical theory, not simply as a historicist narrative uh, with a, uh, a hero, a kind of meta narrative which. Uh, is basically coherent uh, and has uh, a telos even, uh, but rather one that uh, is open-ended and uh, will continue to create what Benjamin would have called dialectical images rather than historicist meta-narratives. So to extend this discussion, um, particularly given uh, post-structuralist influences and post-colonial thought, um, how how wide is Theodore Adorno? And he's a... Uh, He's a major member of the Frankfurt School. Uh, how did he employ what in your in your book is uh, referred to as posterior sublimation, and let's tack on the aesthetic sublimation, uh, to both affirm and critique assessments of authenticity in ritual material culture, which was often stolen from colonized peoples? Uh, did Adorno challenge or confer Freudian ideas, or, or both? We have, we have to... We have to step back a bit and ask what uh, sublimation uh, when it comes to aesthetic questions by mean. Sure. Why Adorno was skeptical of the uh, what we might call official Freudian view. Uh, to a certain extent, Freud reduced uh, aesthetic products to the sublimation of libidinal desires, the sublimation uh, of uh, personal, uh, maybe even neurotic uh, impulses, which were then uh, realized in forms that uh, gained not simply idiosocratic, but rather uh, we might call them uh, culturally valuable uh, and collectively meaningful uh, new works that uh, were somehow uh, able to transcend the original uh, neurotic uh, impulses that, that uh, created them. But Dono was very anxious to avoid this uh, analysis because he thought that uh, basically sublimation ended up uh, taming, domesticating, uh, 
uh, had creating a kind of affirmative version of culture, one in which uh, the libidinal desires, the impulses that were transgressive, were to a certain extent uh, domesticated in ways that made them uh, basically um, uh, no longer critical, that made them somehow conformist. Uh, he also disliked the idea of reducing works of art to simply an expression of the neuroses or the desires or the sublimation of their creators. The works of art gained their own autonomy. Works of art gained, we might say, a force that was material that transcended that of the uh, vital, spiritual, uh, creative energies that created them. So he argued against uh, sublimation and talked about uh, the works of art uh, and the artists expressing a kind of idiosyncrasy that was uh, peculiar to the artists and led to works that gained uh, relative autonomy. He was a believer in the modernist notion of a kind of art that became basically for its own sake with ultimate uh, potential to be uh, reintegrated into the world in a critical way, but which could not be reduced back uh, to the, uh, the uh, artist, uh, him or herself. Now, having said that, and this is the argument of the essay that you're, uh, you know, poking a bit at now, uh, there was a notion of sublimation in Adorno. One, uh, there are two two dimensions. The first is the idea that uh, the artist sublimates rage, sublimates not libidinal desire but anger, and this sublimation uh, keeps alive, we might say, in the work, the indignation uh, at the uh, inequalities, the exploitation, the suffering that the artist is in touch with. So works of art uh, are not simply um, sublimation of desire, but also uh, may in fact involve the sublimation of anger, rage, uh, and uh, the uh, justified critique of the actual suffering uh, that still goes on in uh, our society. But secondly, and this is I think the point of the question you're asking, it was what I argue could be called posterior aesthetic sublimation, uh, in which objects uh, or practices which were initially understood in different terms, then become redescribed and, in certain sense, uh, we might say salvaged uh, in a, an aesthetic uh, context. Now, the first example I give of this uh, is devotional objects. In other words, we know in the history of Western art that many uh, objects, for example, uh, altars in medieval cathedrals or uh, works that were uh, you know, there for the glory of a prince, that these were then uh, stripped of their uh, religious or political function and redescribed in aesthetic terms. Uh, the great example in visual arts being uh, the uh, putting of works of art into the Louvre during the French Revolution as part of the patrimony of the country and saving them from the iconoclastic impulse of some of the revolutionaries. And the second great example, which I talk about, is the Redescription of a Bach St. Matthew Passion, uh, which a hundred years after its first performance in a church uh, in, uh, in uh, Leipzig becomes basically uh, a work of aesthetic uh, enjoyment when Mendelssohn uh, uh, performs it in a secular context uh, in uh, the 1830s uh, in Berlin. Now, the point about this is that there's also a second posterior aesthetic sublimation, which is not of devotional objects, but rather of objects that were uh, ethnographically interested, uh, uh, that came from, as you point out, uh, the culture that's often stolen or at least appropriated uh, from peoples outside of the West, peoples who were initially argued to be simply primitive. Now, there are lots of reasons to bemoan this, to lament the, we might call it appropriation of uh, the uh, the cultural uh, legacy of these uh, so-called primitive people, uh, partly because it robs them of their, uh, we might call, uh, original function as objects uh, in practices that uh, had meaning for those people, and instead sees them as simply formally beautiful. Now, Adorno argues against this for two reasons. One, he's against the idea of an authentic original function. He's very much opposed to the ideology of authenticity. Instead, uh, works that can be redescribed in aesthetic terms show their ability to be decontextualized, to transcend, we might say, their original context, to become more than uh, just what they were first uh, functionally used for, and gain a kind of power that moves us beyond 
uh, that use. And so therefore, the aesthetic salvation, we might say, of works of uh, ethnographic uh, art simply in a museum uh, that was used for uh, you know, just uh, anthropological purposes into a, a museum where they are recognized as equally valuable from an aesthetic point of view, something like a museum of modern art. Uh, this is, to a certain extent, an advance in our appreciation of their, uh, we might call it, uh, potential possibilities, their uh, potentiality to be understood outside of their original context. In addition, there is also what he argued uh, was the, uh, we might call it displaced, but nonetheless still powerful um, uh, preservation of the original mimetic impulse in works of art, impulses that involved works that were used, perhaps for ritual purposes, uh, to uh, uh, bring uh, into life what had been uh, lost, uh, what had been medically uh, somehow appreciated when it happened, but which would then have been, uh, you know, basically uh, lost over time. Works of art preserved medically uh, the experience of that initial wonder that was felt by, if you want to call them primitive people or early peoples, uh, in front of a world, a world of nature, a world of animals, a world of magical realities, we might say, that uh, had been lost. And so these works contain within them uh, not only the sublimation of rage that he mentioned before, uh, that I mentioned before, but also the sublimation, we might say, of the mimetic relationship to nature, uh, to animals, to uh, external uh, reality, which had the ability, so Adorno hoped, to challenge an instrumental relationship, a dominating relationship between humans and nature. So works of art had that capacity, and their what we might call posterior sublimation preserved that uh, in works that were previously simply understood in their uh, ethnographic uh, context. Collection, well, actually. So thank you. That was a really fascinating, uh, fascinating collection. Um, so the next the the next topic uh, we're going to address, uh, I think, kind of a two two part question, and I think both focus on this notion of uh, quoting here Jewish responsibility um, for and uh, sustaining uh, anti-Semitism, and that seems you know surprising to me. Um, you know, I've, I've read arguments about that. Um, so, uh, again, this notion of Jewish responsibility, I suppose, for anti-Semitism or sustaining anti-Semitism. So Adorno and Eric Erickson both, um, use, uh, psychoanalysis, um, in relation to this, to this question. Um, can you, uh, address their arguments? This is an extraordinarily sensitive and difficult question, which has to be addressed very carefully and with lots of uh, nuance, and I, I can't do just to it, to it here, but let me let me just begin. The uh, essay uh, is on the issue of blaming the victim. And the essay begins uh, with the uh, discussion of the, the joke, which I'm sure many of you, the audience, uh, recall, uh, which concerns blaming uh, the Jews for the First World War. And the joke uh, involves asking, uh, you know, somebody... Um, uh, who is responsible for the First World War? And the person answers, the Jews and the bicycle riders. Uh, and the uh, the interlocutor says, the Jews and the bicycle why the Why the bicycle riders? And the answer is, well, why the Jews? And the implication of that joke is that in both cases, bicycle riders and Jews, there's absolutely arbitrary choice, that there's crazy to involve either of them in the explanation to the First World War. It's a simple scapegoating, which has no uh, resonance, uh, no validity in terms of uh, actual responsibility. Now, what's striking is that Hannah Arendt very explicitly attacked this joke, and very implicitly Adorno uh, and Erickson also uh, agreed that the joke was insufficient to explain why the Jews were singled out, not only for things like the origin of the First World War by anti-Semites in Germany after the war, but also uh, over millennia, alas, uh, for various, uh, we might call them alleged uh, sins, crimes, or whatever. So the question is a very delicate one. What not uh, is the well, what is not the blame, but rather the active responsibility that the Jews play in creating the animus 
that sometimes leads to anti-Semitism and sometimes at its worst leads to even exterminist anti-Semitism. Now, the first point to be made in responding to this is to say that there is something called a phantasmatic version of the Jews. The idea that there is a coherent and eternal uh, community which shares in every possible way all characteristics, uh, that there is some sort of reified notion of an essential Jew, uh, of a Jew who exists uh, no matter what uh, pretensions are made to assimilate, uh, no matter what historical differences, that there is something called the Jew, which is even crazier than the idea of uh, the Jews. And I think uh, all three of our protagonists in this essay, Adorno, uh, Erickson, uh, and Hannah Arendt, uh, are very uneasy with that idea, because it's quite clear that empirically, if we take it from what we might call anomalous point of view, all we have are individuals who are grouped under that category. And just to take random examples, uh, Albert Einstein is not uh, the same thing uh, as uh, Bernie Mbeda. Uh, and uh, politically, uh, George Soros is not the same thing as Stephen Miller. So the idea that the Jews present a kind of united front with some sort of conspiratorial elders ruling uh, what they think is obvious, absolute nonsense. Having said that, it's also true that for 2,000 plus years, the community uh, of people who identify with the category of being a Jew has survived, uh, has survived diasporic uh, dissemination uh, and dispersion, uh, has survived incredible attacks on its integrity. So there's something, there's some glue, there's some you know, complicated series of uh, uh, let's call them self-understandings, as well as external uh, stigmatization sometimes, uh, that keeps this uh, tribe, as it were, together. Now, it's a tribe that is, you know, very self, uh, let's say, lacerating, is by no means unified, and yet somehow, somehow, it stays together. So having said that, the next question is, is what is the, uh, what are the characteristics which have created animus, which have created the uh, feelings of uh, hostility, which, alas, we now see, as I'm speaking today, uh, have their force around the world. I mean, it's one of the standardest things about the current moment, that what was seen as something that was subsiding is now, once again, uh, cresting. And anti-Semitism shows its ugly face in many, many different contexts. And all three of them gave extremely complicated answers. And I, I can't, you know, I, I would, we would go on for hours if I tried to do justice. And I would have to actually go back to the paper because it's so nuanced. But there were several questions that uh, were addressed by them. One Freud himself brings into play, which is the idea that the Jews invented uh, a monotheistic God, a jealous God, a God who was basically a demanding God, a God who was also morally very, very strict. Uh, and... Uh, helped introduce a certain amount of guilt and a certain amount of self-restriction about uh, bodily desires. And as a result, there was a kind of uh, resentment against that God. And uh, the God of monotheism uh, was a God who asked an awful lot of uh, his uh, believers, and uh, there was a certain reaction against that. But in addition, there are other moments. Uh, Erickson, for example, argues that one of the things that was resented was the very capacity of Jews to remain unified uh, as a, an identity over long periods of time, when other groups, and here he points out the Germans in particular, were very nervous about the, uh, we might call it, uh, longevity of their self-identity. It was very difficult to know what it was to be a German. I mean, after all, uh, this was a, uh, a country that did not have a unified nation state until well into the 19th century, and uh, its boundaries changed rather dramatically throughout the 20th century. Uh, and it's not clear what it meant to be German. And so there was a kind of envy of Jews who had a certain identification over time. Uh, <clears throat> there's also a complicated critique of the idea of the Jews and uh, relativization, which uh, also meant that they had the ability to adapt in ways that undermine a rigidity of identity. So that's a slightly different, maybe even uh, opposite position. Uh, that they were envied uh, not merely because they had a... a I would call it abiding identity, but also because they were able to live in different contexts, uh, able to relativize their uh, situation through assimilation. Two very different uh, arguments. Adorno was much more interested in other aspects uh, of uh, the uh, reasons for anti-Semitism. One, we might say, was because of 
uh, things the Jews did which might be problematic, such as uh, being the, so he argued, uh, the sort of canaries in the mind for capitalism. Uh, and resentment against capitalism could easily be turned into resentment against Jews. And this was, of course, uh, what August Babel, the 19th century German leader, called the socialism of fools. But secondly, and the Jews were also, uh, in a way, uh, capable of, of gaining uh, enmity through uh, envy, uh, because they seemingly uh, achieved uh, a kind of happiness without having uh, to work. They achieved the kind of unity of uh, their uh, their community. A lot of things that uh, were seen as essentially, uh, you know, positive but nonetheless uh, enviable traits. There are many other aspects uh, of what constitutes. Uh, the sources of uh, uh, hatred of Jews that Adorno points out, uh, turning to uh, Hannah Arendt, however, a very different position uh, is uh, articulated, which has to do with what she sees as the Jews' political deficit. That is to say, after the end of uh, the Jewish uh, nation uh, and the destruction uh, of the Second Temple, there was a kind of diasporic worldlessness an alienation from the world, which meant that uh, the Jews found their, uh, let's say, a utopia not in this world but in the next, and as a result lacked a kind of experience uh, in the world of politics. Uh, they lacked uh, a basic uh, tradition uh, of Jewish uh, self-rule. Uh, and from her point of view, this was a, uh, a loss that uh, it uh, was, from her point of view, freedom uh, was a, uh, a function of being politically active. Now, the irony of this position, and this is where we you know, really go into uh, complicated territory, is that when the Jews did gain political uh, sovereignty uh, with uh, the creation of the state of Israel, it was the wrong kind of politics for Hadar, <clears throat> because it was politics basically as ethno-tribalism rather than as democratic pluralism, politics that was based not on ethnic identity of uh, being a Jew, but rather politics that was based on the inclusivity of anybody who wanted to join the demos rather than the ethos. And so she argued the Jews were attacked for being ethnically uh, too, uh, we might say, parochial. Uh, now, this is, you know, as I say, these are all very complicated arguments. I can't do them justice. But what they alert us to is the extremely awkward and difficult issue. I'm trying to make sense of why... Um, there is some sort of abiding uh, hostility to Jews, uh, which may involve their own agency, which may involve their own, uh, not to be blamed, because they obviously don't bring it upon themselves intentionally, uh, but may involve a kind of, let's call it explanatory responsibility, which means that it's more than just the random uh, scapegoating that the uh, bicycle rider uh, joke uh, seems to, in a kind of shallow way, uh, imply. Yeah, I was going to address uh, our aunt in the second part of my question. Thank you so much. Um, so let's shift gears to uh, uh, your essay on, uh, well, part of it on uh, the authoritarian personality uh, published in 1950. I did want to note that this uh, influenced uh, Richard Hofstadter in U.S. historiography, Richard Hofstadter's uh, paranoid style thesis. Um, I mean, really, I think the question, the question here is, uh, the difficulties for, uh, pathologizing, uh, political posi positions, um, in the context of authoritarian, uh, personality. Um, if you can explain the Mac and uh, Larry, uh, briefly explain the Mac and Larry thesis of the authoritarian personality and, uh, uh, your, your critique, and then also, uh, Adorno's, uh, take. Uh, well, first of all, you have to make sure we understand authoritarian personality was the collective work that was done uh, by Adorno and uh, a number of members in the Berkeley Public Opinion uh, Study Group. Um, Leo Longfall's work was on, uh, with uh, Norbert Gudeman, The uh, Prophets and Deceit, which was one of the other texts in the uh, five-part uh, series of the studies uh, in authority. Having said that, uh, uh, the authoritarian personality was an attempt to apply social scientific techniques of uh, opinion study, uh, 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 survey opinion study with uh, psychoanalysis, to come up with syndromes, which would explain why some people, despite their, we might call it alleged ideology, their surface uh, political positions, uh, had characterological inclinations to 
turn in either authoritarian or uh, non-authoritarian directions. So the figures of Larry and Mac were, we might call them uh, ideal typical figures based on the data that was um, amassed through the, uh, the surveys. Now, precisely how the surveys were done is much contested uh, in contemporary political uh, uh, science. But the point being that Mac and Larry were two ideal typical terms, uh, Mac being an authoritarian personality, Larry being non-authoritarian. Now, uh, without going into what makes these syndromes uh, you know, tick, and it would take a, a long time to go through each of the various characteristics, the point I want to make in this essay is that there is a potential problem, and this is where the eminent critique of critical theory comes in, with creating pathological types, pathological character structures, uh, because it uh, assumes that there is something called a normative type, uh, a normal as opposed to pathological, one that is uh, uh, healthy, uh, quote unquote, one that is not degenerate, but rather uh, vital and so forth. Now, I begin the essay by saying that if you look at how uh, the Chinese uh, tradition, uh, and I wrote this essay after a trip I took to Beijing in 2019, how the Chinese tradition of authoritarianism is really difficult to map onto the analysis of authoritarian personality, you realize how we might say provincial or historically specific the analysis was. Because in China, notions of authority are very different from notions of a personality that is authoritarian in the way in which it's described in the work uh, of the authoritarian personalities uh, 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 writers. Uh, it has to do with a benign notion of authority, which is more reciprocal. It has to do with notions of uh, patriarchal or paternal uh, relations, which are hierarchical in the society. There is, though, in other words, Larry in the Chinese context, who is a uh, liberal democratic uh uh, alternative to authoritarian personality. And therefore, it, it would be very difficult to map it onto the Chinese experience. Not entirely impossible, but difficult. The second problem is the non-authoritarian personality, which the Frankfurt School had a lot of difficulty in establishing. In its earliest work, uh, and this uh, goes back to Eric Fromm's discussion uh, of workers' uh, personalities in the late Weimar period, there, the alternative was not between authoritarian and liberal or authoritarian and democratic, but rather authoritarian and revolutionary. The revolutionary personality was shown uh, to be, or the rebellious personality, something different, shown to be the opposite of the authoritarian. By the time they got to the United States, however, the revolutionary personality as the antithesis of the authoritarian had dropped out. Instead, something called the liberal personality or the democratic personality was put in its place. Now, what that precisely means is difficult to say because at the very same time, Adorno and uh, the other Frankfurt School members outside of the study were attacking liberalism uh, as itself, in a way, a weak and uh, not, not very powerful alternative to authoritarianism, which had uh, maybe even the uh, potential to become more authoritarian. Now, the real issue, though, is a more, I would say, substantial problem with the idea of contrasting normal and pathological. And here I draw on Foucault and Conguillem and others who argued that uh, pathologization, both of psychology and of social uh, behavior, uh, was based on a very distorted notion of the norm. But the norm itself contained within it uh, latent, we might call them political and ideological uh, uh, prejudices. And what was considered pathological was itself problematic. So, for example, uh, in the period of the 19th century and early 20th, when something called degeneracy was seen as the opposite of normal, that included uh, sexual deviance, uh, which we today would not uh, apply as a pathological uh, you know, category. It included uh, sometimes aesthetic modernism. Uh, in Max Nordau's book, And Art to Degeneration in the 1890s, the aesthetic modernist was seen as somehow sick. Uh, and so we're aware of the fact <clears throat> that pathologization of external problems is uh, deeply, I think, uh, problematic. And this is even uh, worse when it becomes uh, extended to our political opponents. So today, sometimes the authoritarian personality uh, argument is applied to the supporters of authoritarian populism, the MAGA uh, Trump supporters who were seen somehow 
as part of a lunatic fringe. Now, the difficulties of doing this is that, first of all, it says, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm healthy, I, I, I'm normal. You, my opponent, you're nuts, you're crazy, you're part of a lunatic fringe. And this becomes a kind of dismissal of whatever legitimate grievances the other person might have, and also makes it impossible to have uh, a deliberative democratic uh, exchange with that person based on the better argument, the kind of Habermasian notion that democracy necessitates listening uh, and arguing rather than simply asserting uh, and uh, imposing one's own position. So it short circuits that democratic alternative, and I think that's the major uh, issue at hand. The pathologization of our opponents uh, makes it very difficult to have uh, a legitimate uh, democratic discussion with them. Now, this is not to say that some of our opponents aren't really nuts. And I would you know, be the first to agree that there are some people who seem to support radical authoritarian populism from a position not only of ignorance, but also of resentment uh, and what might be called on some level uh, a kind of uh, you know, psychological disturbance. I mean, I, I can't deny that. Uh, but, you know, something, sometimes people on our side of the fence uh, also uh, are acting out their own craziness. And so we have to be very careful before uh, we tar everybody on uh, the other side of the political divide with the uh, notion that they are simply uh, pathologies, uh, pathologically uh, 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 rather than uh, responsible uh, adults. I fully agree. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, this is kind of a, uh, this next question is kind of, I don't know if it's a standalone essay because it is in dialogue with the rest of the essays. I thought it was interesting. Uh, really briefly, uh, can you, uh, you you compare uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, Irishman uh, published in 2019? He actually has a film out uh, this this year um, from an, actually an author that's been on this podcast. Um, and again, you compare the film with uh, Orheimer's analysis of racket society, the idea of racket society. Can you uh, delve into that just really briefly and the impact on our current political culture? Well, in that essay, I compare Scorsese's The Irishman uh, with On the Waterfront, the film that Aaliyah Kazan made a generation earlier. In the latter film, uh, corruption of the waterfront uh, is met by a kind of uh, heroic uh, willingness to um, become, uh, you know, basically an informer and a, uh, uh, you know, someone who's religiously motivated as a priest involved and motivated by the love for a woman. Now, there are complications in the origin of the Aaliyah Kazan film because he was trying, some people have argued, to justify his own uh, informing during the uh, anti uh, the, the Un-American Activities Committee uh, witch hunt against communists in the early 1950s. But be that as it may, that film pre presents an alternative, we might say, to the uh, absolute, uh, uh, the absolute uh, domination of uh, corruption and racketeering. The Irishman, on the other hand, the film that Scorsese did uh, five or so years ago is a film in which virtually everybody is infected by corruption, by racketeering. Uh, people in politics, uh, people in economics, uh, trade unions, so forth. Everybody is, in a way, part of the Iraq society. And to make uh, clear what I meant uh, by that, I went back to an argument that the Frankfurt School developed but never fully uh, completed. It was never published in great, uh, in a kind of final form. Uh, about racket society in the 1930s, early 40s, to explain Nazism. Now, the implication of this argument is that traditional society based on rule of law or based on the anonymous principles of the marketplace uh, was being replaced by something that went back to an earlier stage of human development, a stage based on a dialectic of loyalty and protection. Uh, which instead of universal rules or moral principles, uh, instead of the rule of law, there was a rule of uh, the powerful protecting the weak who then submitted to the powerful uh, through uh, a kind of loyalty which did not question uh, what deeds were done and what means were used by the powerful. Now, this racket society meant that there was a breakdown, we might say, uh, of uh, traditional notions of universality and the service of particularity. Uh, and alas, what uh, this type of analysis uh, argued and what the film like The Irishman shows is that racket society has come back. And I argued 
and this was uh, you know the middle of Trump's presidency, that the power of Trump was like that of a racket lord, a mobster who was a, a figure who provided uh, uh, protection for the people uh, he demanded loyalty of. And we see, uh, you know, still today, I mean, it's really rather shocking the extent to which Trump's loyalty uh, is, uh, you know, basically demanded of people who work for him, uh, who are willing, in some cases, to break the law. Now, what's, I think, uh, particularly telling is that he is now under indictment for racketeering, that the RICO, uh, RICO law, which is applicable in Georgia as well as the United States, has been used in the cases that are attacking uh, his... Uh, uh, his involvement in the G January 6th uh, insurrection. So uh, in a way, uh, we might see, see the RICO laws as the revenge of a society where rule of law uh, holds against Trump's attempt to create a racket society. Now, we're in the middle of this, and it's not clear that the rule of law will triumph, and it's not clear that uh, Trump, even if he is indicted, and, even, and this is amazing, even if he's convicted, will perhaps become the next president of the United States. And if that's the case, then racketeering will once again uh, dominate the rule of law, as he puts into, uh, you know, positions in the Department of Justice and elsewhere, uh, his cronies, uh, his subordinates, the people who owe him loyalty. So the basic argument of that piece is that we're now at a very, uh, I would say, uh, vulnerable moment in which the rule of law, and even, you know, let's say the impersonal, uh, the impersonal workings of the marketplace, are being challenged by the regressive uh, racketeering uh, model of loyalty and dependence based on powerful uh, figures, warlords, we might say, uh, like Trump uh, and others around the world, see other figures who also uh, are trying to undermine the rule of law in their own society. So it's, uh, I think the, the film itself, the Irishman, is very precedent, prescient in precisely that respect. So uh, in 2020, uh, literary critic Frederick Jameson published The Benjamin Files. How did he attempt to reconcile Benjamin's theological ideas uh, with historical uh, materials? And that's the first part of the question. And then um, also uh, your criticism of uh, Benjamin's limitation on the rise of nominalist modern uh, astronomy, um, as well as Jameson's earlier essay on Benjamin, which he argued capstones a 2020 argument. So again, uh, Frederick Jameson's attempt to reconcile uh, Benjamin's theological ideas with historical materialism. And then uh, second, how this links up to uh, Jameson's uh, earlier uh, earlier um, arguments and then the idea of Frederick Jameson. Well, this is also a very hard question to answer quickly. I mean, Benjamin uh, was a remarkably inventive uh, and uh, risk-taking uh, theorist who uh, attempted to integrate elements of uh, theology, which you may not have fully understood, uh, into a kind of historical materialism that would not uh, become, uh, you know, basically um, dependent on a philosophy of history which was triumphalist uh, and on the uh, necessity uh, of uh, the uh, change from capitalism to socialism, which uh, perhaps it animated second international uh, Marxism or maybe even uh, the third international as well. So what Benny was trying to do, more or less, <clears throat> was to win the powers of intoxication, as he put it in his essay uh, on surrealism for the revolution. And included among those powers of intoxication were the residues of theological, uh, let's say, um, fantasies or hopes or theological elements, which often were uh, basically uh, you know, seen as... Uh, uh, heterodox uh, and even blasphemous by uh, mainstream theologians. Now, among these, and there are quite a number of them, uh, is the idea of uh, apocatastasis, which is the idea that ultimately, uh, at the end of time, uh, everything that was, uh, you know, basically uh, negative or sinful will be redeemed, and every person who committed sin will ultimately be saved. The kind of ultimate uh, forgiveness, an ultimate hope that things will produce uh, a kind of utopia in the afterlife or judgment of God, uh, which will get rid of the uh, difference between those who sinned and those who did not. And this goes back to the church father origin, and it was considered, in fact, a heresy. But uh, Benjamin thought it was uh, one that could be, in fact, useful for uh, 
uh, a renewed version of historical materialism, that uh, there was a kind of ultimate utopian hope. There were other aspects of his utopian hope, a belief in the uh, restoration of Adamic names, a very complicated argument, uh, and so forth. Now, Jameson has had, over his long career, a very complicated relationship to Benjamin's work. And uh, at one point, he argued that it was too melancholic, uh, that Benjamin was simply um, unwilling to see in the actual history that existed uh, in the current world possibilities for uh, emancipation, but instead held out for an impossible notion of redemption that can never be received, uh, achieved, and therefore Benjamin was ultimately a defeatist. Uh, the kind of idea of a uh, kind of eternal melancholy. Now, in his most recent work, uh, in the Benjamin Files, he tries to move against that earlier version that he had given us of Benjamin towards one that stresses Benjamin's uh, positive, redemptive, utopian uh, hopes. And one of these is in the idea of apocalypticism. Now, my argument in this review of that book is that uh, this is deeply problematic. Largely because it makes uh, the claim, and this is one that uh, Horkheimer and Marcuse uh, explicitly uh, argued against, that suffering in the past can be redeemed. Instead, they argued that people who were uh, in some ways exploited or who suffered in the past, that their suffering cannot be redeemed through a kind of what might be called uh, historicist theodicy, in which partial evil uh, becomes functional uh, in the service of a greater good. The partial evil of the suffering of the past being redeemed or uh, somehow, uh, you know, in a way a sacrifice becomes uh, useful in redeeming or saving people uh, can be justified. And so they had what might be called, I would say, a more realistic version than Benjamin did. And I don't think that Jameson gives us um, a satisfactory um, defense of Benjamin's theological claims here in trying to reconcile them with the reality of the historical materialism, which doesn't try to cover over the suffering uh, that exists in the past and which, alas, is still going on today. Now, as for the nominalist, I mean, I don't know if we move to that question, the nominalist uh, modern astronomy uh, uh, moment in Benjamin's critique. This is also somewhat complicated. It's a point that I make in greater detail in my forthcoming book on magical nominalism, which is now impressed with the University of Chicago. I mean, there the argument is simply this. The rise of nominalism in the 13th century uh, helped to create the context in which modern astronomy uh, destroyed the notion of an ordered cosmos, a cosmos in which there were uh, harmonious relationships between uh, the celestial uh, world and the sublunary world of human existence, one that, say, astrology still continues to argue is the case, uh, that it created a much more contingent world, a world of infinite rather than finite uh, uniformities and uh, regularities, a world that was uh, ultimately illegible, uh, a universe that was illegible, the open universe rather than the closed uh, cosmos. Now, what's fascinating about Benjamin is that he had a certain nostalgia for uh, the uh, world that was lost, the world of cosmic unities, the world uh, that was still preserved in as astrology, preserved in graphology, and served uh, in a number of different uh, places, for example, in Baudelaire's notions of correspondences, uh, and that this would somehow be um, a valuable uh, tool, we might say, a resource in the critique of the nominalist world of uh, absolute uh, we might call it singularity and uh, uh, non-repetitive uh, infinity. Now, Jameson is, you know, obviously not a believer in cosmic uh, harmonies, but does think that historical narratives involve the possibility of figural representation, the idea that there are patterns in history which may repeat themselves, something that to a certain extent uh, gets from Alain Badieu or even more uh, originally from uh, the study he did with uh, Eric Auerbach, who talked about uh, figure. The idea here is that we have to be uh, hopeful that as the Old Testament allegedly prefigured the New Testament in Christian thought, the revolutionary uh, acts of the past, the revolutions of, say, 1789, end of 1848, of 1905, of 1917, maybe even the 
quasi-revolutionary activity in 1968. All of this can be understood as prefiguring, uh, in a way, the revolutions that will uh, be achieved in the future and which will bring into uh, reality what had only been potentially uh, hoped for in the failed revolutions of the past. And this is a kind of, you might say, resurrection of the figural notions uh, of cosmic harmony, uh, which are then, of course, displaced from something that's static uh, and repetitive to something that is uh, historically open-ended and prefigural in terms of the achievement of something which is potential rather than something that's repetition of something which actually was achieved in the past. Now, I'm not you know, fully happy with this. The argument of the essay is that it doesn't do full justice uh, to the need for human agency rather than the hope for prefigural uh, repetition. So I'm not sure if that gives you a, a full answer to the question. It's a very complicated issue, but the essay tries to spell out uh, my qualms uh, against uh, Jameson's reading of Benjamin. There's satisfactory uh, for uh, the audiences. I've read it. And I, uh, I think I understand it. Um, so the next is uh, about uh, the dangers of collapsing uh, the early 20th century notions and beyond that of uh, French and German uh, or these ideas of Lieben Corpor. Uh, if you can go, uh, you can explain that briefly um, as well as uh, uh, he means attentiveness to uh, corporate mortality and your concerns about so-called uh, necropolitics. Well, this essay is based. Th this essay is based on the mobilization of a distinction that was introduced by uh, a number of early 20th century thinkers uh, in Germany and uh, in France. Uh, people like uh, Plessner, Helmut Plessner, and uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. The distinction between the body understood as Leib, L-E-I-B, and Körper, K-O-O-M-L-A-R-P-E-R, Leib and Körper. Leib means the body basically uh, in terms of uh, its uh, vitality, its subjective agency, the body as containing uh, creativity, the body as containing vivacity, the body as something which uh, feels uh, in a kind of existential way. Uh, rather than uh, the body as kerpa, which is the body as observed from the outside, the body as uh, the flesh that is uh, perhaps, uh, this is the experience we all have uh, uh, in the doctor's office, the flesh that is looked at as if it were an object uh, which can be uh, you know, cut into for surgical purposes, which can be massaged, which can be externally, uh, you know, somehow uh, uh, basically the... Uh, uh, restored in a war to a world of objects uh, external to itself, animals as well as animal ones. Now, the larger point here is that rather than seeing one as good and the other as bad, one is healthy and the other is pathological, one as involving life and the other as death, and therefore, since it involves death, something we want to avoid or uh, object or simply not take it into account, it would be healthier to understand uh, our bodies uh, as always uh, both at the same time, as containing within them, and this is why Kerper is connected to the idea of corpse, the reality of our mortality, the reality that uh, is expressed, we might say, by our bony infrastructure, which survives after we die. And th this is important to take into account, not because it celebrates death, not because it celebrates, uh, as that our politics argues we should not do, uh, the, uh, we might call it, uh, let's say, dispensability of the mere uh, life that we, uh, but uh, instead, because it understands that we are always already, we might say, our potential uh, inert and objective realities that will become the full reality of where we are in the corpses. And it does this, and I, I argue elsewhere, because of the distinction between uh, uh, people and population and political discourse, and why we should take that distinction into account. And what I want to argue there is that the idea of the people, the idea of the active uh, people that we think of when we talk about uh, popular sovereignty or the will of the people, uh, whether we understand it as a demos, that is to say, a politically active uh, collectivity, or as an ethnos, uh, which is a tribal uh, uh, identity, we talked a bit about that earlier, we discussed NRS critique 
of Zionism uh, as wholly tribal. When we understand those two uh, versions of the people, we also have to take into account the uh, inert notion of a population uh, which is not active politically as citizens. So, for example, the migrants who come to our countries uh, or the children who don't have a full vote uh, as a citizen or uh, people who are uh, incarcerated in our prisons that are not full citizens, they're members of the population of, a, of the society. They are members of a group that needs, as it were, to be honored, protected, taken into account, and not simply dismissed as outside of the people and therefore not having uh, power, not having a claim on us. And the reason for this is that if we take seriously our role as Kerper, we ourselves will always be, as it were, part of the population. We will always be vulnerable. We will always be in need of the care of those people who have the power uh, of peoplehood. And therefore, it alerts us to the fact that we have a continuity of interest, a uh, continuity of identity with people who are normally stigmatized as not part of the people, not citizens, as not us. Uh, but as them, that there is always, you might say, a them in us. There is a uh, dead body, a kerper, in our life, uh, in our uh, in our own selfhood, and that we ought not to overly privilege the agency uh, that we feel as lie, but also accept the passivity that we should feel as kerper. Now, this distinguishes itself, I would argue, this recognition of the death that the kerper portends from necropolitics or Sanito politics, terms that have been introduced uh, by uh, Giorgio Agamben and uh, uh, Raya Achille Mbembe and uh, uh, Roberto Esposito, to describe, and they base this on uh, Foucault's notion of biopolitics, to describe a certain notion of a deliberate attempt to treat people uh, as if they were uh, expendable uh, and to uh, treat them as uh, basically pathological enemies in a healthy society which needs to be nurtured. It also avoids the very, very complicated and problematic uh, belief that some people can be sacrificed, that their deaths are uh, justifiable uh, in terms of the uh, ultimate health, the ultimate vitality of a community. I mean, we see this today, just to give it a, a kind of very current uh, point, we see it in the way in which Hamas uh, not only uh, killed 1,300 Israelis when they attacked uh, Israel on October 7th, but also very self-consciously, very cynically, uh, created the situation in which the Israeli response has sacrificed at least 10,000 uh, Palestinians. That Hamas made the argument that, uh, or at least tacitly accepted the argument, that these people could be sacrificed, that their deaths did not matter because the larger cause of Palestinian freedom, which might not be achieved for a hundred years, could justify their deaths. This is a sacrificial logic, and it's used by you know virtually everybody who defends war, that somehow it's functional in the service of an ultimate uh, goal. And occasionally we can make, I think, a legitimate argument for that, but in many cases it becomes a, a horrible justification for the deaths of innocents who were sacrificed today for some alleged uh, benefit in the future. Why a person's life today is less valuable than a person's life 100 years from now is extremely hard, I think, to argue. Now, the Leib Kerper uh, you know, alternative says, no, no, we all have, we all share uh, a kind of uh, mortality which cannot be understood in terms of sacrificing for life, that we have to, as it were, honor uh, that mortality by taking uh, ourselves seriously uh, as sharing in uh, the vulnerability of others. And that we ought not to have the belief that we can sacrifice those others, uh, as say suicide bombers do, uh, in the service of a larger alleged core, uh, uh, cause, which is uh, justified in terms of the people or the nation or the health of the nation, uh, which basically reduces us simply to lie writ large rather than Kerper uh, writ small. <clears throat> So uh, your final essay I thought was really, really uh, interesting. So I want to uh, want to end on this. Um, uh, so you offer a pretty touchy critique of Karl Marx's uh, uh, a sort of a, a, a reification of truth and politics. 
your criticisms did derive in part from uh, Hanarek's analysis of lying in politics. So I guess my question is, how ultimately does the reification of, I think you call it a big truth, uh, periodically result in uh, persecutions of individuals uh, labeled uh, hypocrites uh, and uh, fabulous? And, um, you know, I, I was thinking, is there any connection to uh, or its arguments in banality of evil? Uh, this essay was uh, an essay written um, uh, quite a while ago when I was doing work on uh, the book that became The Virtues of Audacity on Lying in Politics. Uh, and it was um, basically a, a, an attempt to apply the argument there to Karl Marx and to Alain Badiou. We were supposed to be together, Badiou and I, at a conference in Santiago de Chile. He never showed up, but the essay was really aimed at him. The argument here is, is fairly straightforward, that both Marx and Badiou uh, may have erred in arguing that politics was a particular locus of truth-telling and of uh, trying to achieve the truth. And here I use Hannah Arendt's critique of that. I mean, it's a very complicated critique in her essays on truth and politics and lying in politics, which I also draw in, in the book versus mendacity. The argument here is that although there are truths that we have to take seriously, the truths of facts, for example, she points out uh, that no one could argue that uh, Germany invaded uh, Belgium in 1914. Uh, you can't make that argument historically. Uh, but that this notion of truth in politics, factual truth, does not exhaust the realm of the political, and that we can't have, as Badiou argues, truth procedures in politics, simply because politics is the realm more of opinions, of values, uh, of worldviews, uh, of discrete interests, which uh, are not reducible to a single truth, uh, that the attempt for a singular, universally shared consensus in politics is inherently anti-pluralist uh, and always ends up uh, by privileging one position and calling it the universal truth, that even if we have a a general will, all of you. So this will does not, in fact, represent the will of everybody. It's always a, what might be called metonymic displacement from one particular to a universal. So having said that, the point is that uh, politics involves at least a certain modicum of uh, fabrication, of hypocrisy, of shading the truth, of varnishing the truth, of spinning the truth, and this is ultimately a good thing. Now, it's a good thing, however, and here I introduce the argument uh, uh, that Derrida takes from Plato uh, in terms of the pharmacon. The pharmacon, uh, as I'm sure many listeners recall, is a potion uh, which has good effects when the portion, uh, when the amount of it is small, and bad effects when it's uh, too uh, large. That is to say, when it is given in small doses, it can be uh, basically uh, something that cures. It can be a drug that helps. Giving in large doses, it'll kill you. So, you know, you commit suicide by taking a whole bottle of, uh, I don't know what, uh, aspirin. Uh, but bottles, uh, but a single aspirin will help your headache. So the pharmacon of lying means that basically in uh, moderate uh, and often uh, very, let's say, um, you know, almost... Uh, self-referential terms when people know that they are lying, uh, it can be helpful. An example being uh, when a politician uh, is in a primary race with another politician uh, and argues that the other politician will, if elected, be utterly and completely a disaster. And then when the other politician gets the nomination of his party, the first politician forgets that he had said that or she had said that and says, well, I'm now backing uh, the choice of my party and forget all the insults I leveled against them a, a while ago. I wasn't really, uh, you know, expressing my real beliefs. Now, we know it's a game that's played that there is a kind of hypocrisy here, and it's a sort of healthy hypocrisy because uh, politicians need, we might say, to bring together uh, coalitions. And these coalitions have to uh, have a certain amount of deception to create uh, the possibility of acting together. Uh, it was fascinating when that book was translated into Russian. Uh, they put on the cover, not the cover that I had had, uh, which was George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, which showed 
basically the hypocrisy at the beginning of the American notion of honesty, but rather a picture of Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt at Yalta. The implication there was that the three uh, heads of the Allies during the Second World War knew that they were lying to each other. Uh, the Churchill uh, was lying about the ending of the uh, British Empire, that Stalin was lying about uh, his uh, beliefs uh, the spread of communism in Eastern Europe, that uh, Roosevelt was lying about what he thought about uh, the preservation of the British Empire and so forth, and that this was necessary to beat the Nazis. Now, the Pharmacon model, however, is helpful because it tells us that when a big lie is told, such as the lie that uh, the MAGA Trumpites tell us about the so-called rigged election of 2020, this uh, is dangerous uh, to the nth degree. That's not the same thing as lots of small lies and half-truths. But it is also, in a way, a mirror image, the big lie is, of the idea of an absolute big truth in politics. And then anybody who argues that there is a singular truth, that he or she has that truth, is going to be basically a problem and maybe even uh, a totalitarian or autocratic leader. And so both the big lie and the ideal of big truth seem to me uh, deeply, we might say, anathema uh, to the political uh, pluralism and the openness to uh, what we might call the uh, realm of opinion and the realm of value and the realm of worldview that makes politics an endless process of negotiation, of compromise, of argumentation, of deliberation, rather than a process which ends with a singular truth uh, and the deadness of a society where no change uh, is possible, no critique is possible, no imminent critique to come back to our original point of departure uh, could ever be made. Okay, uh, so that's it for uh, our, the book, at least. I have uh, one follow-up question. You mentioned a uh, forthcoming or in-publication book um, from the University of Chicago Press. Uh, can you uh, talk just really, really, really briefly about that? Well, this is a book called Magical Anomalism, and it's an extremely, I would say, um, risk-taking, crazy, slightly uh, impossible book, which tries to argue that it, as opposed to the, what I call conventional anomalism, there was a subterranean tradition which argued not simply to restore either real universals or uh, to uh, see the world as, uh, we might say, vacuous contingency upon which subjective uh, imposition categories uh, could be uh, you know, possible. Instead, I argued for the uh, response of the singularities, the uh, magical or wondrous or enchanted uh, particulars of a world which uh, could not be subsumed uh, under human control or the self-assertion uh, of uh, a modern subject. Uh, and I try to look at this in a variety of different contexts. One is Walter Benjamin's theology uh, cum uh, politics of the name, which he gets to some extent from Jewish sources. The second is the discussion of the idea of the event in post-structuralist theory. Uh, the third uh, is what uh, Nelson Goodman called uh, irrealism, the American philosopher, or anomalous philosopher, realism, which I look at in terms of Marcel Duchamp's pictorial anomalism and Adorno's discussion of musical anomalism. And finally, um, a chapter on the idea of the photograph not photography, but the photograph, as interpreted by Roland Barthes uh, and uh, Siegfried Krakauer. So as you can tell from this very quick and uh, hurried description, the book is attempting a lot. Whether it all pulls together uh, remains to be seen, but I'm very excited about it. Uh, and it should be out by, uh, I think, late uh, next year, probably in the fall of 2024. And then we'll get a, a chance, I hope, to discuss it uh, on another uh, one of your broadcasts. Oh, we will undoubtedly so, sir. All right. So uh, thanks, uh, Professor Jay, for being on the podcast today. My pleasure. Okay. So the book is uh, Eminent Critiques, Prepare for School Under Pressure, published uh, a couple months ago by uh, Verso Press. This is Ryan Tripp. I've been uh, your host for uh, the New Books Network, History and Critical Theory channels. Please tune in next time.